Hello, everyone, and welcome to the International Association for Impact Assessment, Impact Assessment for Belt and Road Initiative Projects. We are so pleased to be bringing you this webinar this morning, this afternoon, tonight, or perhaps very late at night. I'm Professor Sarah Bice from the Crawford School of Public Policy here in beautiful Australia with the Australian National University. And we are so pleased to welcome all of you to this really exciting discussion. Before we begin this evening, and we have a number of terrific presenters for you covering all aspects, the types and stripes of impact assessment that are contributing to and shaping China's massive Belt and Road Initiative projects. But before we begin, I'd like to take a moment to acknowledge the traditional owners on the land where I'm broadcasting from, the Wurundjeri people of the Kulin Nation, and to pay my respects to the traditional owners and custodians of the lands wherever you may be joining us from. And you are all welcome. We have had almost 600 registrants for this particular webinar and hundreds more getting in touch with interest, but they are currently asleep. So we will be producing a video uh, of this webinar and you can share that with your friends and colleagues afterwards. For those of you who may be new to webinars, there are some really terrific interactive features that we would like you to know about because later in the program this evening, we're going to have an opportunity for Q&A with the panel and we would love to hear your questions. And indeed, a number of you have already sent in some really terrific questions even prior to the webinar beginning this evening. So you can use the Q&A questions feature on the sidebar in the GoToWebinar control panel. And let me just show you here with some handy visuals what that is going to look like. You'll see there that we have the questions panel and I'll put my cursor here so you can see that. The other thing we'd like you to know about this evening is that in the controls panel, you'll also see a drop down box that says handouts. And for those of you who, like me, have a little bit of trouble reading text on small screens, you'd be happy to know that if you click the drop down box on those handouts, you will be able to access PDFs of tonight's presentations. So if you'd like to open those and be able to see things in larger text than what may be on your screen, please feel free to use that handouts feature. And we'll also be providing copies of tonight's presentations through the IAIA website after the webinar. We're really pleased to bring you this webinar as part of IAIA's Webinars on Demand program. We're doing some webinars coming up around ESG. What is it? Why is it important? How does it relate to impact assessment? We look at issues like compliance and enforcement of impact assessment, particularly environmental and social impact assessment requirements, commitments, and related permit conditions understanding impact assessment. So some really terrific primers and intros to what we do as the world's leading membership body for impact assessors all over the world. We have nearly 7,000 members in 120 different countries, including through our affiliates and branches. We also offer online training and mentorship through our professional development program. And upcoming events that you'll want to know about include our IAIA 2021, my goodness, goodbye 2020, we'll all be glad to see the back of you. And in 2021, we are going to host the IAIA annual conference online with new online training course opportunities. We also offer through the IAIA.org website a range of free downloadable publications, including best practice principles and impact assessment fast tips. So we really encourage you after this webinar, if it's your first time with IAIA, come and check us out. We're a lovely bunch of people. We hope you can see that tonight, even through cyberspace. Uh, really, we encourage you to get involved. And if you're a student or a young professional, we also have groups just for you. And tonight, indeed, we have a presentation from a student young professional uh, who's been doing some terrific work around the Belt and Road Initiative. So I'm hoping everyone out there in cyberspace understands how to use the features that we have available for you. At any time throughout the evening, please feel free to add uh, questions to the questions panel and we'll be moderating those on your behalf later on in the webinar. 
But without further ado, let's get to our absolutely fabulous panelists. We have been working on putting this webinar together now for well over 12 months. It was something that we hoped to hold as an in-person symposium in Beijing uh, with my very good colleagues at Tsinghua University, where I'm also a special guest professor. That obviously couldn't happen this year, but we're very lucky to be able to hold this virtual forum today. And so our first guest is a very dear colleague of mine from Tsinghua University the School of Public Policy and Management, Professor Xu Feng Zhu. He's currently also the Associate Dean at SPPM and Executive Director of the Institute for Sustainable Development Goals, another initiative which I think is close to the hearts of many of us in impact assessment. He's Deputy Director of the Science and Technology Development and Governance Center at Tsinghua University. And Chu Feng, because he's a man with a lot of free time, is also Director of the Think Tank Research Center of the School of Public Policy and Management. You're going to hear a lot from Xu Feng tonight, particularly about green BRI and how we advance green development through the initiative. But his research interests also include the policy processes, think tanks and expert involvement in major policy and looking at environment and climate policy, particularly public governance in transitional China. So it is my great pleasure to turn the webinar and the screen over to my good colleague coming to us today from Beijing, Professor Xu Feng Zhu. Xu Feng. We always have these issues, folks, online. Hang with us for just a moment, and we're going to get Xu Feng's sound, and we will be good to go. We can see you, Xu Feng. We're just waiting for your sound to come through. Sarah, can you try and unmute him manually um, as the presenter? I'm trying to. <laughs> Hello, cyberspace. Uh, here we go. Okay. Xu Feng should be yeah. available now. You... Perfect. Okay. So. Uh, We're all good, Xu Feng. Good, good. Yes. Uh, thank you. Thank you, uh, Sarah. And thank you, colleagues, for inviting me to share some, some of my new a uh, very br uh, uh, brand new uh, research project. Uh, okay, so uh, my topic is uh, impact assessment of BRI, green development. Uh, as we know that uh, BRI, uh, uh, Barrel Road Initiative has uh, a, a large number of investment and also a large number of uh, 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 countries that uh, in, uh, that was uh, uh, were invo uh, involved in uh, a project. So actually, uh, the 
green development of Bell Road Initiative is very important uh, because uh, uh, it is a it is a comprehensive scientific uh, ecological system uh, cover the green policies, uh, uh, green finance, green trade, green production, and the green infrastructure and the green energy, green consumption, transportation, supervision, and the ecological compensation and the green evaluation. So actually, uh, if we can do uh, pro promote green development uh, in DRI initiative, uh, we we cannot say that the uh, BRI is successful. So uh, it is committed that uh, to uh, achieve a coordinated uh, ecological and uh, uh, social and uh, 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 economic, economic development of a country along with the Bell Road Initiative. The following green, low carbon and the sustainable development path uh, uh, is very important uh, in BRI construction. So, uh, uh, in, actually, we have a, 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 a impact assessment for green development of BRI. Uh, we collect data uh, from 65 countries and the regions to rating uh, this uh, uh, potential uh, green, uh, green development like uh, the uh, status quo and uh, the uh, trading uh, trending of the development of the green uh, green BRI. So we use the matched uh, indicators with uh, set, uh, three dimensions: environment, society, and the economy. And uh, we have a threshold. So we uh, we set three uh, uh, four thresholds: uh, red, orange, yellow, and uh, green. To, to label these different uh, countries uh, with the different uh, trade, trade, uh, different trend of the development, and also we uh, uh, we uh, which uh, uh, correspond to the uh, development status of the uh, decreasing low uh, trending and also the uh, uh, some kind of trade. So uh, we use actually. Uh, uh, we we now let's uh, uh, let's introduce uh, our indicator system. Let's say in is environment, the in environmental impacts. Uh, we classify the three different uh, uh, aspects of environmental impacts, like uh, environmental quality, environmental governance, and the resource usage. So we have different uh, 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 third level uh, uh, indicators, and also. Uh, for the uh, economy, uh, we have uh, uh, economic development and uh, econo uh, uh, ecologic, uh, uh, ec uh, economic economic uh, uh, growth engine. So this is the uh, uh, economic impact. And then it's for society uh, because uh, SDGs, sustainable development, uh, has also uh, like uh, the, uh, related with. Uh, uh, more equal, more livable, and uh, more tolerant, tolerant society. So we have uh, uh, equality and uh, livability and uh, uh, environmental tolerance uh, with the social impact index. So with this, uh, all the uh, impacts and uh, indicators, we compare the different uh, uh, countries uh, uh, with the environmental uh, environmental impacts between different types of uh, uh, BRI countries. From the perspective of per capita environmental footprint, it has obviously uh, categorized uh, uh, different uh, uh, characteristics. Uh, the higher of the level of the development of the country and the higher of the per capita of the, of the uh, footprint. So uh, we have three uh, figures, uh, the Y, is uh, different. Uh, the, the first Y is the land print, uh, footprint, the second is the carbon uh, footprint and the nitrogen uh, footprint. And then we uh, calculate uh, the, uh, the trade, uh, the trend of the green development of the BI countries. Uh, we label the uh, four uh, colors with red, orange, yellow, and green. Uh, four different uh, uh, colors 
the environmental indicators of most uh, countries along with the BRI uh, are moving toward uh, green development goals. And the uh, countries in Asia and the countries in Central Europe are uh, constantly uh, approaching green development expectation of the goals. So uh, we can see, uh, for example, uh, green, green countries like Albania, Armenia, and uh, Britain, uh, Cyprus, and uh, Georgia, and uh, uh, Maldives, and so on. So uh, we use this uh, method to to uh, ask uh, uh, to, to evaluate uh, these uh, countries, uh, the uh, development of tra trading, and uh, to uh, warn uh, their countries with red label. And then we uh, we uh, analyze another issue is the balance of economic development and the green sustainable development. So actually, we have a, a trade off between economic development and uh, energy compensation and the carbon footprint. We use the method of uh, uh, typeo de uh, decoupling method to uh, to analyze and consider that. Uh, most uh, BI countries are in the stage of non decoupling and the weak decoupling. And the uh, decoupling state uh, is divided into three categories. Uh, the so called decoupling means uh, uh, if, the, if it's a non decoupling, which means uh, if country has faster uh, economic growth, uh, it has faster uh, uh, energy, energy compensation. Uh, so this is a parallel development. So the company is better because uh, uh, if the, uh, the economic uh, growth is uh, faster, but uh, the growth of the energy compensation will be slower or even uh, degrade, uh, uh, degrade. So actually, we we uh, calculate a different stage between economic growth and uh, energy compensation. Uh, so. Strong decoupling uh, means uh, it's uh, uh, negative uh, decoupling means uh, this is very not very good. But uh, uh, if uh, the uh, decoupling uh, is stronger, so we can see different countries has um, uh, different uh, uh, performance of decoupling between economic development and the green sustainable development. On the whole, countries along BRI have uh, changed from negative decoupling to decoupling. And uh, the average level of this stage, uh, weak de uh, decoupling and uh, compared with the period from, uh, from 2010 to 2013, uh, the number of strongly decoupled country increased uh, significantly from uh, uh, 2014 and 2015. And uh, mainly the uh, Eastern European countries and uh, East, uh, uh, Central Asia countries. The final uh, issue is uh, the balance between the economic development and uh, uh, we use uh, a positive impact and the mixed and the negative impact about the COVID-19 pandemic on the uh, green BRI issues. Uh, we, we, we say, uh, we, we find that uh, economic impact of the COVID-19 is highly negative impact and um, um, uh, for uh, the global ec uh, economy and uh, some business and also massive uh, uh, fiscal deficit and uh, serious trade uh, obstruction. And for the economic growth engine, uh, this is a negative, uh, the COVID-19 is a negatively, uh, highly negative impact uh, on reduction of industry output service such as tourists and uh, tourism and uh, uh, and uh, travel restrictions something so final final issue is uh, slide is uh, we have some uh, proposals for action plan for green development of BRI uh, firstly is development and the utilization and of uh, green energy second is green finance and the green investment and uh, third is uh, social response uh, uh, Corporate, corporation social responsibility uh, action of, uh, of firms and uh, companies, and uh, biodiversity of uh, protection. And the final one is uh, climate change governance. 
So this is a very broad and uh, brief introduction of my uh, current research. Thank you. Shifeng, thank you so much for that presentation. It's wonderful to have your view from China giving us those insights into not just the Belt and Road Initiative, but the Green Belt and Road. And we appreciate as well that you've already started very rapidly to look at the coupling factors that you mentioned, but in relation to COVID-19. Um, the pandemic is going to shape so many things in our world for a long time to come. And it's really interesting to see that research coming out. And later in the webinar, we're going to look specifically at health impact assessments. So that will be one of the issues that we pick up on. Thank you very much for your presentation. Um, please hang with us because in just a little while, we're going to come back and ask you some questions and invite you to join our other panelists and a Q and A. But in the meantime, what we'd like to do now is move on to our next presenter. Our next presenter is coming to us all the way from Venezuela, where it is well and truly the middle of the night. And so we have a terrific pre-recorded presentation for you. Jean-Luc Fiol uh, is another colleague from the School of Public Policy and Management at Tsinghua University. And I'm really pleased that in Jean-Luc's presentation, we have representation of students and young professionals. He's currently a master's candidate at SPPM at Tsinghua University, all the way from Venezuela. And he serves as executive director of SABRI, which is the Student Association of the Belt and Road Initiative also based at Tsinghua University. This is something really close to my heart because IAIA as a membership organization, I know how much we can accomplish and do together. And it's been really wonderful to see a group of committed students get together and form their own membership body. Uh, they all come from countries that are either signatories to or working with Belt and Road Initiative projects, including Venezuela, where Jean-Luc hails from. Uh, they now have more than 1,000 students from different regions and es have established their own worldwide network to help build cross-cultural communication channels among youth. And the association, SABRI, if you'd like to look it up, S-A-B-R-I, and we will provide you more information about them uh, on the IAIA webpage after the webinar. Sabri has helped to become a leading reference for understanding and analysis of the BRI. It's also providing a platform for cooperation and dialogue between youth around the world. So a really important initiative. And we're going to hear now from Jean-Luc Fiol via pre-recorded message because we did forgive him and say, you don't need to come online at 2 a.m. And so I'm going to call now on our wonderful backroom moderator from IAIA, Tanya Fraser, to play Jean-Luc's video. Hello everyone, my name is Jean-Luc Fiol. I'm a master's student at the School of Politics in management and before diving into my presentation i would like to thank professor sarah Weiss and international association of impact assessment for the invitation and making this webinar possible my topic today will be regarding build a road from the professional perspective the work of sovereign environmental considerations in latin america the service stands for the student association of Belt and road initiative i was their former executive director and currently i'm part of the board of members the association is currently the first and only international student association focused on the study of the road it was founded in 2018 with more than 1,000 members from more than 80 countries. It has strong close partners with very renowned institutions from the university, and its vision is um, to basically develop an international educational platform uh, which promotes academic and cultural exchange among global youth on China's BRI, as well as to Tsinghua University's international image. Coming to the second part of my presentation. So, Basic environmental observations on the BRI. Um, we need to first understand that the BRI is founded on five key goals. The one that I want to highlight here is to facilitate connectivity. So China, in order to accomplish that goal, is building the most railways connecting China with other countries in order to foster trade and investment. Of course, there are other development projects like seaports, airports, hydropower plants, coal plants, 
dams, pipelines, and even spatial economic zones. But they want, what they want to rescue here is that all these types of projects are large infrastructure projects. They will come, or they have their own unique construction complexities. They have their own impact area and impact intensity. So whether we like it or not, I consider that they will have an inherent environmental impact. This is why it's so necessary to thoroughly deliver impact assessment at the early stages of every project in order, in order to mitigate environmental and social risks. Uh, however, there are certain obstacles to that. We need to, we need to see that um, there is a regional demand, for example, in Asia, on the energy, transportation, and communication sectors. So that's together with most of those BRI countries are in their early developing stages. So those countries with a huge market demand that China can fulfill, in second, in the early developing stages, they will pay much attention and focus on fast industrial, well, achieving fast industrialization, fast economic growth, and minimum social standards for their citizens. They will not pay so much attention and rely on taking actions on environmental conservation, developing sustainable development plans, or uh, carrying out sustainable policies. Maybe on the mid and long run, but not on the short run, sadly. So I wanted to bring up a case in Peru because Latin America has recently entered the BRI. It was actually in 2017 after the second BRI forum. Uh, just a few countries from the Latin American region are recently partnered to the BRI, like Peru, Ecuador, Argentina, Brazil, Costa Rica, and so on. Why I wanted to highlight Peru and Latin America? Because all the projects, BRI projects, has been success successfully implemented in that country. And it's because the country itself has a very explicit, transparent, and well-drafted impact assessment procedure in which all the stakeholders that are potentially implicated during the planning process of a project are taken into consideration, engaged, and there's clear responsibilities or clear actions in, in which we can see which are the responsible responsibilities of the government authorities and which are the responsibilities of, of the company representative. Most of the projects here are focused on the mining sector. So here you see a table with the main regulations, environmental regulations of Peru. Peru has specific environmental impact assessment, a uh, specific environmental impact assessment law and regulations, and it even has a regulation focused on delivering transparency, access to public information, participation, and consultancy for the people regarding environmental matters. It doesn't matter if the, it's environmental matters related to development projects or not. Here we see who is in in charge of monitoring, reviewing, and carrying out the environmental impact assessment procedure, who is also the institution in charge of reviewing the project's proposal by, in this case, putting an example, the Chinese company. If a project is approved, it will get the environmental certification. If a project doesn't have the environmental certification, it can start there, it can start, it, it can start operations, basically. This slide, what I want to highlight is the red circle. It's here I want to mention that in the um, Peruvian impact assessment procedure, there are four key steps in which the public, not the public and the affected local communities are required to be engaged. The first one, the prior consultation and public participation plan is under the responsibility of the company. So the company needs to do a prior consultation to the local community. Basically, it's to gather information, explain a bit about the project, gather concerns, and this public participation plan, the PPP, is basically a plan that the company needs to come up and deliver to the government authority and explain them which actions or responsibilities they would like to take or they're willing to take regarding the affected local community by the project. First, it can be with webinars, conferences, explaining a bit about the project, which are the potential environmental and health risks for them. <coughs> Sorry. Second, um, establishing if they're willing to offer certain job opportunities, if there's going to be a relocation, what they're going to do during the relocation pro process, if they need to acquire the land of the local communities, how they're willing, what are, what is the amount of money they're willing to pay it, or which are the negotiations that they're going to carry out, and so on. And we also have um, a public hearing. In the public hearing, that's from the government side, the government authority is required to call representatives from the local communities, NGOs, 
civil society from the province and representatives of the company as to representatives of the local government authorities. So putting all the stakeholders together, basically, they will create what we will see here, a negotiation table. And this negotiation table basically um, has certain uh, clear, certain advantages that my consideration is that this is why those projects or Chinese projects have been carried out so successfully, because um, we need to we need to see that I mean it's it's a complete new environment, complete new continent, even language. Okay, uh, so if there's no understanding, no communication between the within the stakeholders, there's a lot of chances of misunderstanding, false communication, and make mistakes during the planning process. Uh, of the project. So why the negotiation table has been so successful for, for the Chinese projects? Because they can approach directly to the local communities, NGOs and the civil society. They know their faces, they know who they are. And from the affected local communities, they, it builds um, a bridge of trust because they also know who are the representatives of the company which are their faces, they understand which are their intentions, what is the project for. And the government authority, of course, they will serve in this case or can serve in this case as mediator, but also as ruler. So to see like, okay, I will support the local community, but at, but also we need to do this project because it will be good for the country, et cetera, et cetera. So these negotiations tables are like the end goal of the environmental impact assessment procedure in Peru. And as I mentioned before, it's it has been like the, the key, the pillar to the successful outcomes of all the BRI projects. So positive outcomes here is that, as, I, as you see in the table to your right, stakeholder engagement, identification, uh, relocation, land acquisition, those procedures are clearly outlined as to who is going to be responsible for. Environmental and cult cultural aspects are going to be preserved and protected. The health risk and waste pollution are going to be discussed. There's human rights protection from the affected, um, um, affected communities. There's transparency and accountability during the whole process. And of course, because you know all the all the stakeholders implicated, because there is so much discussion and clarifications of the concerns and risks, the, the, the risk itself from the pride that may arise are lowered almost to its minimum. And of course, it will avoid unnecessary delays and investment losses. So my general consideration to that is that it's mandatory for the planning of BRI projects to understand very well the coast country's legal and political conditions. And why I say that? Because a, a company can be as much as environmental friendly as it wants, but once it enters a, the jurisdiction of our country, it must abide by the rules and regulations of that country. And of course, it will certainly to understand its customs and, and, and political conditions. Uh, why political conditions matters? Because if we're talking about uh, a country that is in a in the process of transitioning from one government to another, uh, the projects may be paralyzed, of course. If on the legal aspect, if the, there's no clear environmental protection policies, regulations, and, and standards, basically the ones who are going to hold accountable the company for any damages is the affected local communities and the society. And what is going to happen here? That it's going to increase the social opposition to the project and even it can extend itself to the image of the BRI, something which we have already seen, for example, in countries like in Sri Lanka, Myanmar, that due to the strong local opposition to the, to the project, it has uh, spilled over to the government authorities saying to the Chinese companies, we need to paralyze it because the, polit the political, let's say the political risk has scaled too much for us, the political pressure, sorry. And together to that also, I have been also seeing that there's a, a, a movement from, from China to RBI countries to develop environmental protection bilateral agreements or MOUs, which also I think it's a powerful tool right now or, or better than what we have experienced so far. Um, to have a more concisive and strong tool to hold on. Um, to hold companies and government authorities accountable for protecting the environment during the planning process of, of BRI project. So thank you very much for your attention regarding my presentation. I hope that well, the things I could talk about have been clearly stated and wish you the best till the end of the webinar. So
Thank you so much, everyone, uh, for hanging there with Jean-Luc's presentation, which gave us a really terrific overview of some of the interests of students and young professionals in the Belt and Road Initiative, as well as a fascinating case study from Peru and a look at the ways in which uh, particular political and policy contexts play a really important role in understanding how Belt and Road Initiative projects roll out. We are very lucky to also be joined uh, today by two presenters who have been working together for some time now, and we will hear in a moment from Dr. Thierry Ong. So Thierry is from Myanmar originally, and she is currently a research fellow at the Asia Center, Faculty of Arts and Sciences at Harvard University. She's currently asleep. It is the middle of the night in the US right now. So Theory has kindly provided us with a pre-record uh, of all of her ideas. Her current projects explore the impacts of natural resource extraction on ethnic armed conflicts. Uh, she has also looked at environmental and livelihood issues in conflict affected areas in Myanmar. Prior Absolutely. to joining Harvard, Harvard University. Dr. Theory was a postdoctoral researcher at the School of Environment and Energy at Peking University in China, so right next door to Tsinghua. Her project explored the environmental and socioeconomic impacts of the Belt and Road Initiative with a particular focus on natural resource extraction and infrastructure development in countries along that initiative. She's published extensively on environmental impact assessment, life cycle impact assessment, environmental economics, waste management, land use, and land cover changes and environmental rights. And I'm just getting some sounds. I'm going to ask Tanya if she can um, make sure that all of our presenters uh, are currently on mute. Fantastic. Our other presenter following Theory's presentation is Thomas Fisher, who is Professor of Impact Assessment and Environmental Planning with a particular interest in transport and spatial planning, as well as health. And he's based at the University of Liverpool in the UK, where it is very early in the morning. He's also an extraordinary professor at Northwest University in South Africa, and he will be very well known to many of our IAIA members on the call because he is the editor of our very own journal, Impact Assessment and Project Appraisal. And for those of you who are interested and think you might be a budding author or someone who wants to publish, we'd also like to let you know that IAIA is a very prestigious scholarly journal, but we also accept professional practice papers. We want to be a journal uh, for members. So IAPA, have a look at that if you're interested. Uh, Thomas also directs the University of Liverpool's Environmental Assessment and Management Research Center, as well as the WHO Collaborating Center on Health in impact assessment, a real jack of all trades. And now in the background, our fabulous facilitator extraordinaire, uh, Tanya Fraser is going to play for you Dr. Thierry Ong's presentation on her take on the Belt and Road Initiative. Over to Thierry. Hello everyone, thank you very much for having me here today. My name is Thierry, I'm a research fellow at Harvard. My current research is on the environmental impact assessment of armed conflicts and natural resource extractions. I have been extensively researching on the EIA of the Chinese investments in developing countries, particularly the Belt and Road Investment Projects. The topic of my presentation is the differences in EIA across Belt and Road and their compatibility with Chinese EIA system. Since the beginning of BRI, both the Chinese government and the many participating countries have been exploring ways to make Belt and Road sustainable. But in practice, the integration of different countries' laws and regulations and actual implementation remain challenging. And I think we can explore some of the reasons why that may be the case in my presentation. So there is so much that can be said about the topic of EIA across countries in Belt and Road. And that can be fed into a 10 to 15 minutes time period, but I'm going to do my best to cover the critical points here. 
Earlier this year, Professor Thomas and I jointly published two papers on this issue, one from the effectiveness perspective and the other from the economic approach. I would like to highlight some of the key findings from this research and also some updates on China's progress in the implementation of EIA in BRI projects. I'll start with EIA systems effectiveness across Belt and Road, highlight some of the key challenges and good practices. I would also like to talk about the possibility of integrating EIA with project approval process and whether our research was able to find some relationships between EIA and the economic growth. So in our study, we covered 65 BRI participating countries from Europe, Central Asia, South Asia, East and Southeast Asia, and the Middle East. The analysis of the status of EIA system using scoring approach shows both similarities and differences. So one good news is that all countries have developed legal frameworks for EIA, although there are some questionable areas and deficiency in terms of their implementation and other capabilities. In East and Southeast Asia, in terms of administrative requirements, scoping, screening, monitoring, and public participations are mandatory in almost all the countries. They have established EI guidelines, and also EI results are somehow incorporated in the decision-making process. But some of the biggest weaknesses are found in making EI report publicly available, the transparency in decision-making process, and the delivery of EI training for the practitioners. The adequacy of financial and human resources are also questionable in many lower income countries in the region. Because lower, lower income countries in the region fall behind China in resource allocation and EIA expertise. The bigger problem is that some countries in the region are in fragility, conflict and violence, FCV setting, which usually have poor institutional capacity. Another problem is the prevalence of anti-China sentiments in these countries. This issue might aggravate challenges of BRI and also impact assessment. But the regional collaboration is strong in this region and the donor organizations are quite active, which is good. But it is important to improve the stringency of regulations to China's level. And the implementation of EIA in other countries in South and Southeast Asia is a lot later than China. This is good and bad because although the systems are not as established as China, the EIA is still evolving and there are a lot of opportunities to improve. And having a close tie with China also can be beneficial for further collaboration and resource sharing. So moving on to South Asia, there is a lack of strict compliance of EIA and the decision making process is also problematic. Administrative and government support for EIA is poor and donor seems to be disproportionately focusing on India. However, having adequate human resources and capacity, especially in India, Pakistan, and Bangladesh, can be helpful in the overall improvement of EIA. Um, substantial gaps between the law and its enforcement was one of the biggest issues in Central Asia. There are also a number of deficiencies in public participation and disclosure, scoping and screening, and resource allocation. On the bright side, some countries are drafting scoping and screening requirements. When compared with Chinese EIA, most of the countries scored lower. But it is so important to note that EIA system in most of these countries are based on SEE established under former Soviet Union, which can be very different from the Chinese EIA. So we should be careful when comparing their EIAs. The World Bank support is a strength for monitoring EIA of BRI projects here. There's also China's uh, Greening the Belt and Road in Central Asia project, which can be a good channel for. EIA. Um, in the Middle East, most countries developed their EIAs in the late 1990s, and the systems are still not yet well established. There is a clear lack of public consultation in most of the countries. Although most countries are wild rich, some of the lower income countries suffer from the lack of resources and government support. The regional collaboration on environmental protection is also lacking. But donor organizations are quite active in these countries as well in terms of developing EIA policies. Although EIA in Europe is generally considered strong and well established, some countries in the region are newly independent states and these countries have weak EIA implementation. But there are some really good practice examples, for example, the compliance with EU EIA directives and having transboundary EIA in most of the countries. 
One of the key problems is in transparency in decision-making process, even for the highest performing countries. Also, developed nations should really focus on supporting lower-income countries in terms of financial, technical, and human capacity. Lastly, in the light of collaboration effort, I think the Belt and Road Ecological and Environmental Cooperation Plan and the Asian Infrastructure Investment Bank are the key organizations that can take initiatives in strengthening and synchronizing EIE systems. The authorization of life skill projects is already very challenging itself. The need for EIA will create additional challenges for BRI. Countries will need a framework to integrate EIA and BRI project implementation. We should pay close attention to public participation, transparency in decision making and resource adequacy in almost all the countries. Also, China's weaknesses in transboundary EIA and opaque decision making can become a problem for these projects. The project approval process in China involves two different processes for sensitive and non-sensitive projects. Currently, the environmental consideration is not embedded in the process. I believe it is possible to integrate EIA into some steps like risk assessment, approval, monitoring, and auditing. We can go deeper into integrating transboundary EIA in each step of project approval, but that is out of the scope of this presentation. Our recent papers um, address this in greater detail, so I'll go ahead and end this here. Thank you very much. We are really pleased that Theory was able to take the time to pre-record that really fascinating and insightful overview of Belt and Road initiatives, particularly relative to uh, Myanmar and some of the places where she's doing work looking at the issues around emerging economies and the challenges and opportunities implicit within BRI. Theory's co-author on some recent publications is Professor Thomas Fisher, and we're going to turn now to a short presentation that he's prepared with a focus on his area of expertise, strategic environmental assessment. So Tanya, you can work your magic. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, everyone. I am going to briefly talk here today about the need for strategic environmental and social assessment of the Belt and Road Initiative. In this context, on a few slides, I'm going to focus on Pakistan as a case study. To start with a few acknowledgements, there's a number of people I worked with on various aspects of the BRE Initiative um, over the last few years. Um, and those include Yanying Huang and Professor Xu He from the Chinese uh, Nankai University's SEA Center, uh, as well as um, Abdul Wahid and Professor Khan from the uh, International Islamic University in Pakistan. And then also, as uh, Theory mentioned a few minutes ago, uh, my work with uh, Theory Aung. In terms of SEA or SESA requirements um, of 65 BRE countries that Theory and, and I looked at, we found that 14 had formal requirements in place. Um, and those countries include in Asia, China, Indonesia, Vietnam, and Bhutan. And then there is also nine European countries. Um, importantly, there were other countries where um, SEA guidelines or requirements in certain regions or provinces were in place, and those include Pakistan, Laos, and Thailand. Crucially, no strategic environmental assessment or strategic environmental and social assessment of the overall BRE initiative is being conducted or has been conducted. What is um, SESA or SEA? Most people associate it with a process that may look like this, which is applied to a specific policy plan or program. However, there is now some consensus that only if the um, decision support tool is considered as a framework where assessments are conducted um, for um, the different important decision tiers, including strategies and policies, then plans and programs, can it actually be effective? And in this context, 
important questions to be answered include why are we doing something, what are we actually doing and how, where and when are we doing it. So coming to Pakistan as an example, starting with a few facts. Um, Pakistan is highly vulnerable to climate change and has very high levels of air pollution. And the costs of environmental degradation in 2015 um, were 9% of GDP equivalent. Um, importantly, Pakistan intends to reduce its expected greenhouse gas emissions by up to 20% by 2030, um, which requires an investment of about 40 billion US dollars. Climate change adaptation costs are projected to be between 7 and 14 billion US dollars per year. The energy sector, importantly, is the main contributor to greenhouse gas emissions currently, followed by agriculture, industrial processes and other activities. In Pakistan, EIA was made mandatory in 1994, and it's fair to say that there is some good environmental assessment capacity in the country, um, which was supported between 2010 and 2015 through the National Impact Assessment uh, Program, which was a big capacity development program um, in the country. SEA has legal backing and is a formal requirement in Khyber Pashtunka uh, province, and there's also some requirements in Gilgit uh, Baltistan. Um, importantly, with regards to the overall policy context, there is a national sustainable development strategy and this sets 17 sustainable development goals with strategic objectives and targets. And uh, also importantly, um, this commits to integrating climate change and the environment into national and provincial sectoral policies, plans and strategies. The BIE, uh, BRI uh, initiative in Pakistan um, is implemented through the China-Pakistan Economic Corridor, CPEC. Um, it's a development plan worth $62 billion. Um, dollars, um, and this is uh, or equates to 70% of total investment as foreign direct investment to Pakistan. The monetary value of this initiative is greater than the accumulated um, foreign direct investment to the country since two, uh, 1970. The main investment are in um, infrastructure and energy projects, as you can see on this map. Um, and when it comes to power projects, um, well, somewhat worryingly, uh, quite a few are actually coal-based. So the question arises, how about policy coherence with um, what I just talked about uh, in terms of the sustainable development stra uh, strategy and uh, um, the policy coherence um, paradigm um, formulated in that. There is also a government's alternative energy policy, which commits to 30% of the energy mix being from renewable resource uh, sources by 2030. Um, however, CPEC projects are expected to result in an increase in greenhouse gas emissions quite substantially. Um, also, northern Pakistan, um, a gateway to CPEC, has a highly vulnerable and sensitive ecosystem um, uh, system that are threatened. Um, in addition, CPEC is expected to lead to a transition from rural to urban economies, and that has implications, for example, with regards to water demand. So what should happen? Well, to start with, we do need an SEA or SESA of the BRI initiative overall. Um, also, we should always conduct national uh, policy coherence assessments, um, as well as um, assessments of national implementation plans and programs. And in this context, enforcement will be really important. Right, um, thank you very much for your attention. Um, this is a new book um, coming out, which I um, edited with Ainhoa Gonzalez, and um, it's uh, called Handbook on Strategic Environmental Assessment with uh, over 27 chapters coming out next year. Thank you very much.
Thank you so much to Thierry and Thomas for sharing their insights and particularly to Thomas's most recent insight there with a case study from Pakistan. So already today we've covered China, Myanmar, Venezuela, Peru, Pakistan. We're really getting through the countries and you can see that broad representation that we have here in the IAIA family of impact assessment practitioners. We're going to go now uh, to a different topic and another area with our next presenter, Francesca Villiani. And many of you who've been around the IAIA traps will be very familiar with Francesca. Uh, she is Director of Public Health and Co-Head of Sustainability for International SOS, but she is also a longtime diehard IAIA member, and I really miss seeing you this year, Francesca, at the IAIA conference. So next year we'll see each other online. Francesca leads global public health advice for international SOS, including health impact assessments and public health surveys in partnership to support evidence-based interventions. She's a stakeholder council member for the Global Reporting Initiative, which is a very important, the world's leading auditing framework for environmental, social, and governance issues, particularly for private sector organizations. And Francesca is a longtime member, as I've noted, of IAIA and a former board director. So she is here with us live from Denmark very early in the morning, but I can also assure you she is very well caffeinated and ready to go. The espresso machine has been going. And I'll hand over the webinar controls now to my dear friend and our next presenter, Francesca Filiani. Francesca. Thank you, Sarah. Welcome, everybody. I hope you can see my screen. Can you confirm that you can see my screen? So just it. Yes. Great. So yes, uh, thanks for the wonderful introduction and really welcome to everybody wherever you are at this point in the world. Um, I would like to make us focus about uh, the health dimension, the health and safety dimension of the BRI projects. Uh, these have been mentioned already by some of the previous uh, presenter. Um, and I think is you know, is an incredible opportunity as well as a risk uh, for the comprehensive health and safety management of uh, any BRI initiative. As Luke was mentioning, they are mainly about infrastructure, they are also about connectivity. So it's important to have a comprehensive um, management of the health and safety risk and opportunity. And this is important because whenever we talk about a project in a given context, and as Sarah was just recalling us, the BRI initiatives will spread all around different type of countries. is a very dynamic uh, management. This is true for other issues, but especially true for health and safety issues. Um, I've been working on impact assessment and especially for mega construction projects for the last uh, 15 years. And um, um, I'm also an expert in pandemics. And one of the aspects that for me is really incredible is that uh, whenever we talk about uh, these uh, issues, quite often projects tend to have a very narrow focused uh, approach to the issues. They tend to focus on things that they can control themselves, so the inherent hazard and everything within the context. But when we talk about infectious disease, we know that this is not possible. Um, you know, everything that we do at the project level has an impact on the law context in the local community and it turns back to the to the project so we need to arrive at a completely different level of understanding this uh, initiative, both being at the local level or as Thomas was recalling us, at the strategic uh, level. Why this is important? Well, I think that uh, in 2020 with COVID, I don't need to convert uh, anybody uh, to the importance of looking at uh, pandemics. I think we are all uh, in agreement. What is important to realize is that um, uh, emerging infectious disease, which we can define as newly appeared or uh, disease that have been existing before are just increasing in, uh, in incidence in a context or in their geography, 
are uh, have increased over the last few years. Uh, since uh, 1970, WHO has uh, counted 40 new uh, emerging infectious diseases. And just to give you an idea, we talk about SARS-CoV-2 responsible for COVID, but we talk also about SARS, MERS-CoV, Ebola, Zika. So all diseases that you're uh, familiar uh, with. 60% of these come from our zoonotics, so we found them in animals, and three quarters of these are in wild animal reservoir. So why this is particularly important when we talk about BRI? Because emerging infectious disease that normally circulated only in wild animals that are not in contact either with human or with pets or our husbandry animals, uh, you know, are, are in a niche. The moment we change and we alter, we intervene at the human animal ecosystem interface, then we facilitate the spillover. So the risk of a new disease emerging and becoming a human disease. Just to give you some numbers, because I think that sometimes we are not clear, WHO says that there are around 7,000 uh, um, outbreaks event on a monthly basis worldwide. Of these, uh, 300 uh, become uh, you know, issues that need to be followed, and around 10 risk assessments are done monthly uh, worldwide. So we know that they are increasing these uh, events. We know that they are becoming very problematic. Um, in 2015, the World Economic Forum was considering the spread of infectious disease, one of the second biggest risk uh, in terms of impact for the world. Of course, this was at the time of the um, Ebola uh, outbreak in West Africa. But you know, five years later, we are in the middle of a pandemic. So. When, and, and we know that the history of humanity, we talk about the BRI initiatives and the Silk Road, so we know that you know, every initiative and in our history has been shaped by the presence of this disease. So I think it's really important to use this opportunity to look at these issues uh, in a different uh, way. This is um, important not only because of new emerging disease, but because we know that a lot of infectious diseases are still present. This is a, a study that looks at the presence of six uh, infectious diseases that are widely distributed in the world, from malaria to dengue and tuberculosis, uh, and combine them and look at them around some of the BRI countries. Again, it's important to consider that therefore a lot of these issues are already present and when new initiatives, new people will come for the constructions, new infrastructure increase the connectivity, you know, we can mix these type of uh, populations in a way that previously maybe were more separated. And again, I think that what we learned that connectivity and uh, flights and trains, everything that make us move more around, increase the risk of disease spreading. That's why you know, we have uh, this unfortunate lockdown everywhere. So again, keep this in mind that whatever we're saying has been already identified as a, as a priority to be taken in consideration at the moment of project design. The Chinese government came out, uh, you know, with the concept of the health uh, Silk Road already in 2016. They brought together different actors with the idea of, in reality, developing a more global health uh, project uh, that could have supported the BRI. So it was independent, but it was going in the same direction. Um, of course, this was uh, reinforced by the COVID-19 pandemics, and uh, China has taken a leadership position in global health security worldwide, um, both because of their role in production and distribution of uh, personal protective equipment and medical device, vaccines. Um, let's remember that three of the vaccines that are at the moment in phase three trials are um, product of uh, Chinese uh, research. Um, institutions. So the, the role that can play is, is really important. And I think that the role that we need to think about, you know, how to use impact assessment and project design in a way to really focus on the preventive instead of the risk is again what uh, the, the main focus is about. Because we shouldn't focus only on infectious disease. Of course, uh, the issues of pandemic and uh, epidemics is very important. But we know that this mega project are 
you know, have a lot of potential other aspects they need to deal with. It's occupational health and safety. Luke was mentioning about constructions. Well, this is where a lot of uh, accident and injuries can occur. But it's also health regulation and prevention of uh, activities. I think that the presenters before have looked at what is the situation of environmental impact assessment. But do we know what is the requirement for health impact assessment? Altering ecosystem services and connectivity, it could generate that any disease, you know, it's not just a wet market in Wuhan, it could be anywhere that, that could increase connectivity among people. Is chronic condition with all the risk factors, uh, accident and injuries, social determinants of health, I think from, uh, you know, we saw in the first presentation, the issues of inequality, how is important. And then health system strengthening, if we talk about sustainable development goals, is the uh, importance of achieving universal health coverage, but we know that not all the countries have at the same level of uh, development. So why so much a focus, uh, I want to bring today, you know, the focus on uh, emerging infectious disease and pandemics, because we know, we know well what are the factors that can facilitate the spillover of uh, a virus from uh, one animal to humans. And this everything that has to do with a lot of the BRI project is land use change, is encroachment in areas that previously were, you know, uh, not habitated by humans, is extractive industry, is deforestation, but it's also food and agricultural system. We talk about, you know, massive production of uh, protein and animals for human consumption in a lot of the BRI country, is human behavior, as well as is environmental system. And if you want to have, uh, you know, a visual, I think that the uh, Ebola virus uh, ecology is a perfect example of what we talk about. And this, you know, is not necessarily Africa. We can talk about the Nifa virus in Malaysia. Uh, this was a virus that uh, generated a large uh, local uh, outbreak, and it was associated with uh, intensification of uh, pig. Uh, production uh, in uh, areas where uh, orchards uh, were deforestated and orchards are the natural habitat of paths. So the pests became very close to the pigs, transmitted to them the Nipah virus. The Nipah virus is highly, the Nipah virus is highly infectious and this was transferred to the people looking after the pigs as well as the slaughterhouse. So is this idea that whatever is happening in the wild animals and the moment we come close to them with our food system, with our infrastructure, we change this. So it's not about not doing it, it's about being aware of the risk and developing mechanisms to control this uh, risk. Also because I don't want to be too focused on the COVID, but I think we know that once a disease is taking place like a pandemic, you know, even though we talk about 2021 being different, the health consequences that have been generated by the COVID-19 are tremendous. I mean, people that have been infected are still suffering, some of them from what we call long COVID. A lot of people are suffering now because of psychosocial issues, lack of exercises, and a lot of uh, uncertainty about the future. And then there will be the long-term uh, impact. You know, hospitals have not been able to function as they should, so a lot of issues will be transferred to next year. So. You know, if we let something take roots and become so big, then the, the cost, uh, human, social and economic, are just too big. And this, I think, is very important just to consider that project being done at the strategic level, as uh, Thomas was uh, mentioning before, or at the single project level, it allow us to look at the uh, interconnectedness of certain changes, because we know that there is a change in environmental, health, social and economic condition. And this can create, you know, a change in a lot of other aspects, like increased contact between life, wildlife, livestock and human population. So this interface, this is a, is a, you know, it could lead to disease emergence and therefore to new epidemics that could be localized or can become pandemic. In the context, and this has been mentioned, not all the BRI country are equally capable of dealing with this outbreak. So if there is a very poor public and veterinary health provision and we don't know it in advance and no research and no support has been done, that's a perfect uh, storm for a new pandemic. But at the same time, it could be an opportunities, you know, impact assessment, and I think that was Luke was mentioning, you know, this table of negotiation, but in reality, you know, it could be also a place where we identify the risk, we invest in a reduction, prevention, and you know, we create capability for, for response. It's possible uh, develop 
development of strong partnership is also the idea of having management plans where everybody is able to respond uh, based on their uh, capabilities. And again, just a, another reminder that we have seen with uh, COVID-19, any type of uh, health and safety issues that become so important threaten sustainable development across all the sectors. So it starts as a health risk is become you know threatening for humanity and it's important to consider that you know to have this early inclusion in uh, of uh, health and well-being when at the project and at the early inception of the design process is absolutely essential and you know it's not only taking in consideration this it's also then doing health impact assessment or integrated impact assessment or including health in the strategic environmental assessment if these are uh, done because only for a comprehensive management of health and safety risk, we can ensure the sustainability of these interventions. And we know that these are dynamic, so we cannot just focus on what is present at the moment that the project starts. We know that the project will enter the local context, so the dynamic, uh, the, this uh, dynamic has to be taken in consideration. And although risks are, um, you know, we tend to look at risk individually, they are interdependent. So a balanced uh, risk management approach, you know, is absolutely necessary because we need to see how things influence each other. Um, there are risk and opportunity, and um, we've been hearing already before, they are transboundary, they are transnational, and require a collaboration across countries and sector. Uh, especially when we talk about health and well-being of human and animals, there is no country and COVID-19 has made it quite clear that it can do on its own. And the national health system need to be strengthened and empowered to provide universal health coverage, but they also need to have uh, capacity building in health impact assessment. Uh, someone has mentioned that not everybody has the same capacity on environmental impact assessment. Well, health impact assessment is also at, um, you know, is still affected by a lack of capacity worldwide. And with this, uh, thank you very much for your attention and looking forward to the subsequent discussion. Francesca, thank you so much for such an expert, thorough and thought-provoking presentation looking at the health impact assessment angle of the Belt and Road Initiative and health being such a top of mind issue for all of us in 2020, but also making that really critical point that as prevalent as our thinking is on the pandemic at the moment, uh, we mustn't forget all of the other critical health factors that relate to major projects like those being delivered through the Belt and Road Initiative. I am really pleased now to be able to hand over the reins of this webinar to a very good colleague of mine, Ben Cave. Ben's joining us from Leeds in the UK today, where it's very early in the morning. Ben is the current IAIA president and director of Ben Cave Associates. He specializes in health and social impact assessment, so I'm sure he'll have some really good, tough questions for Francesca, and he's done that for the past two decades. He works across the UK, in mainland Europe, and further afield with policymakers, public health academics, environmental scientists, and spatial planners. And in 2011, he received the IAIA Individual Award for achievement and advancement in impact assessment over a sustained period of time at an international level. So we are really, really pleased to welcome Ben to the webinar today to lead a facilitated discussion with our panelists for the next 10 minutes or so before we then open up to your questions in the Q&A. So audience members, please do use that Q&A chat box, send us your questions. I'll be feeding those through to Ben in the background. And a friendly reminder to all of our presenters, we would like to invite you now to please turn on your videos so that we can all see you join in the panel discussion. And we'll ask for purposes of good webinar hygiene that when you are not responding to a question, if you could please keep your microphone on mute. Ben Cave, thanks for facilitating the Q&A. Sarah, thank you very much indeed. Um, so I can see Francesca and Thomas. Uh, Zhufeng, are you still with us as well? Um, so when you appear, I've got some, uh, it would be very interesting to hear your thoughts. We've heard some excellent presentations. So from Zhufeng um, on the green, green BRI, uh, Jean-Luc Fiol has, uh, has told us some um, 
fascinating things that the that is developing from the student organization um, that research into BRI and work on the very much on the uh, a good case study from Peru um, we've heard from Tiriang and Thomas Fisher um, on a, a, again looking at the framework for environmental assessments and what that can offer and some of the strengths and weaknesses of it um, and Francesca has has provided us with um, a, analysis thinking thoughts to take into account for um, some of the challenges of um, which society is facing that that may or may not be picked up with um, with environmental assessment and the way environmental assessment might need to adapt to bring that in so um, Zhu Feng a question for you you've um, spoken very persuasively about the green BRI which is a major aspect of this initiative um, of interest to all of us. Um, I understand you also specialize in public policy scholarship. Um, so from a Chinese policy perspective, can you give us some insights as to how the pursuit of the green Belt and Road Initiative aligns with current Chinese policy priorities? Yes, uh, thank you for your question. Uh, um, uh, Maybe uh, uh, there are some uh, differences between terminology or uh, terminologies between Chinese and international uh, international uh, uh, work or international uh, uh, like pro uh, policy agenda. First, uh, in China, actually, uh, there are a lot of policy uh, agenda like. Uh, uh, eco civilization, like uh, uh, low carbon initiatives, things like that. But uh, within China, Chinese government seldom use the international words like uh, sustainable development goals or green uh, and so on to 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 frame their behavior, their behavior or their initiatives. So our as a as scholars, we want to link between the international discourse and Chinese government or Chinese societies uh, initiatives with together, which means we can use international language to rewrite the Chinese behaviors. For example, uh, uh, the uh, Chinese government or uh, they they actually they promote a lot of uh, efforts to uh, to protect environmental uh, environmental uh, issues, but they all of them are saying that this is eco civilization. Eco civilization is a term with the I uh, with I civilization in our Chinese knowledge. Like uh, like uh, uh, material civilization, like uh, uh, spiritual civilization, and the political civilization, which actually uh, it's hard to understand by foreign audience, right? So we want to we want to translate their terminologies, and also we want to we want we want to uh, say their uh, uh, to to ask uh, the Chinese government to uh, to to put their behavior into the framework of the Chinese language. So this is what we are doing now. So uh, your question is uh, what they are doing. If they if we use the international language to uh, describe what the Chinese government has done, actually there are a lot of things. Uh, from, from the beginning, uh, they, they, they use the scientific development uh, perspective, which means we want to balance the econ economic development and uh, the environmental protection. Or we use the uh, like uh, high quality development so recently. So uh, actually, uh, a lot of things have done, have been done. Uh, but uh, maybe uh, international communities uh, seldom know that. So that's uh, what we are doing now. We want to translate their behavior to uh, in international audience. That's fantastic. Thank you very much. Um, so there's there's 
clearly challenges. We can see the map. It's a huge map covering a large part of the, of the world, um, um, 65, 70 countries. Um, if I move on to Thomas now, again, so we're taking that there's that there's a a meeting of um, there's a meeting of cultures, there's a meeting of of, of different ways of understanding the world of uh, and of very much of uh, policy regimes as well. Thomas, you spoke persuasively of the importance of uh, overarching framework, um, and um, I think your work with Thierry shows how that there are there are different uh, capacities in environmental assessment across the countries in Belt and Road Initiative. Um, can you talk about some of the, the challenges um, that might come forward in that different capacity and how that can be addressed? Yes, thank you, um, Ben. And, well, I mean, to start with um, systems have been in existence um, for different amounts of times of, of, of countries that are co-operating uh, in the initiative. And of course, that needs to be taken into account. Now, sometimes we make the mistake, we say that um, countries where um, impact assessment, particular type of impact assessment, um, has been in place uh, for a long time uh, would do better but um, more recent legislation and guidelines um, certainly uh, can be a very good thing. Um, and also um, in, in systems that are sort of new to, to IA and some, some of the countries that we looked at certainly are, um, impact assessment can be more disruptive and that what, that's what impact um, assessment aims at. Of course, there may be potentially a lack of experience, but with an initiative like this, so many countries collaborating, um, there certainly should be um, a lot of scope for capacity building, I would say. Thomas, thank you. Um, capacity building, that leads nicely on to um, uh, almost Francesca's last slide there, talking about um, the need for capacity in um, bringing health more explicitly into impact assessment. Um, Francesca, you know, clearly we're we're all in the grips of the pandemic. We're all um, speaking from our from our homes, from our offices. Um, so this is a very meaningful year to be looking at this. Um, can you, in your presentation, you spoke you spoke about a range of critical health issues and presented very clearly what these challenges are. Um, it would be it would be good to hear your thoughts on how these issues can be brought um, into formally into the Belt and Road, uh, the impact of the Belt and Road Initiative. Uh, and I wonder also, you, you spoke about social determinants of health at many times, and I wonder if you could just explain to the audience the importance of social determinants of health as well. Thanks, Ben. Yes, it's a very relevant uh, aspect. I think, you know, the health people, the health sector use the concept of social determinants of health, but I think similar concepts are used, uh, being used also by the other presenter. When we talk about social determinants of health, we refer to a lot of uh, the issues over which we might have control or not control that have an impact on our health and well-being. This can be, you know, uh, the the wage we get, uh, where, where, where we live, uh, how is our, uh, what are our rights, what are our uh, level of education. So, you know, a lot of factors based on who we are, just where we live, the country in which we live, will influence on our capacity to have control over our decision or not. Uh, Chufeng and Thomas made reference to the issues of inequality or, uh, you know, the discrepancy of economic development among central countries. If we look about Pakistan, you know, what is the capacity very much of local communities or, or certain actors to influence uh, their, uh, their the opportunity associated to the BRI investment? So I think from my perspective is that 
to ensure that whenever a project of the BRI is conceptualized, it takes the health lens to ensure that uh, you know we don't focus exclusively on pollution, which is important, but also is pollution impacting in a differential way different groups, has the same impact on everybody, or is impacting kids and poor and people that might be close to the project in a different way. Unless these considerations are done, this project will have maybe a successful economic return, but will not deliver sustainable development for the local communities because the most poor would be uh, impacted more. And I think that what COVID has shown us is that, you know, inequality are a big problem of our society. It's not that, uh, you know, it's not that were not there, it's just the pandemic made it clear. Um, so this is an opportunity to look at these issues more more systematically. Thank you very much. And I think that, that also, you know, um, is one of the purposes of impact assessment is it's, it, it's essentially looking into the future or looking both ways before you cross the road um, and making sure that there are not uh, unforeseen um, adverse impacts coming coming at you. Um, we've, uh, again, uh, you know, we're talking in, in sort of formal streams about different impact assessments. So we've heard about health impact assessment, environmental impact assessment, SEA, um, but all of the speakers have mentioned the importance of ranging across different topics and of bringing things in. We have an excellent question from uh, an audience member. Um, which is um, asking about social impact assessment. Um, and I wonder if um, uh, maybe I could put that one to Thomas about um, the role of social impact assessment in BRI. And just and before Thomas starts talking, we have about, uh, well, we have a few minutes left. If any um, audience members want to um, send more questions in, that would be great. Um, and so and we'll, we'll endeavor to answer those. Thomas, social impact assessment. Yes, th this can't be comprehensive, um, Ben, th th just a minute. I mean, th the way strategic environmental assessment is approached, uh, it, it increasingly is seen in many countries as strategic environmental and social assessment, and quite rightly so. And we should also add, when we look at the strategic level health, so we have um, strategic environmental, social and health assessment, and I think that's that's at that level, the right approach to take. Um, the, the way we do this integration, I mean, we, we can talk about this. Uh, it, it's, it's more about wh whether we sort of consider it um, different teams in parallel or really in a fully integrated uh, manner. I don't have the time to, to talk about the advantages and disadvantages. There are advantages and disadvantages for both approaches. And, and it's important that people are uh, aware of. But it's something uh, undoubtedly that needs to happen, and in particular because all these issues are, are so um, directly connected. Uh, Francesca, I mean, showed the the the, the connection uh, the, between um, fauna and 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 then uh, humans, and and that's just one example. So absolutely, we need it. Thank you very much indeed. Um, Okay, another question just come in again quickly. Um, how, um, who has the initiative to conduct impact assessment procedures? And uh, uh, Zhu Feng, I'd be interested in your thoughts on this. Um, so BRI um, is the opportunity to make better legislation and develop capacity building, but who can actually do this? How, how can we develop um, um, capacity and guidance um, and, and um, uh, approaches uh, across the, the Belt and Road Initiative, or do we need to? Um, is there a strategic role there, or is it is country by country um, the approach to take? Um, yeah, this is a very good question. I think uh, first, I think the uh, Belt Road Initiative is uh, is an integrated uh, initiative. Uh, actually, it is an initiative by China, obviously, but. Uh, a lot of uh, countries and the regions they are not just a follow, they just not following China. They have their own priorities and uh, development uh, stages. Therefore, uh, no matter uh, whether they are uh, what the stage their development uh, level is, 
actually they must consider itself of their what the priority what the policy uh, agenda and uh, uh, by themselves so uh, for us i think uh, there are different uh, international uh, regime can be uh, 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 can be uh, serving as this kind of uh, uh, this kind of uh, policy uh, issues uh, they actually for example uh, the aib uh, AIB is uh, initiated by uh, China, but uh, this is actually this is an international organization. They decided they decided uh, they decided the, um, what kind of project uh, could be invested in by uh, uh, by the bank and the investment uh, by the AIB uh, into different countries. And uh, actually, this kind of uh, investment is not uh, international aid also the FDI. So actually, this uh, infrastructure building, infrastructure project would be uh, very beneficial to the host countries. So actually, they, they must, the, the, the host countries, have they, they would like to uh, uh, like apply for the different money, different investment uh, from the international communities, and then Make use of their make a better use of uh, in, internalized. Uh, for example, uh, they have a lot of uh, because uh, for example, they are power plants. So power plants, uh, they, if they have a, if they are shortage of uh, uh, power and electricity power, they could uh, uh, apply for the uh, international investment to build their power plant. And of course, they can use their international investment. For them to build the uh, railways or uh, or uh, uh, highways, so this is uh, actually this is not initiated by uh, the China, but the, but they actually this project are proposed by the local government by the host uh, government, and then they initiate they they negotiate with the uh, investors and then they uh, their own uh, companies and the local government, so. Uh, my point is, uh, this is actually this is a bilateral beneficial to both uh, investors and uh, uh, local government, and uh, there this is not uh, uh, like this is not just uh, China's initiative and ask different uh, countries to follow. This is uh, my opinion. Zhufeng, thank you very much indeed. Um, it's it's a well, it's a fascinating and huge initiative and uh, lots of work and, and thinking need to be done. I think this is going to um, inform and influence um, many things for the future. I would like, uh, I'm just conscious of time, um, and um, so I, I'm going to ask each of the panellists um, to have, you have 20 seconds um, to share your final thoughts. I'm going to go to Francesca first, then to Thomas, and then Zhufeng, um, and then we'll hand back to Sarah to um, to wrap things up. So, um, 20 seconds, Francesca, the clock is ticking now. Thanks, Ben. Uh, I think that BRI is an incredible opportunity. We have heard that a crisis should never be wasted. An opportunity should also not be wasted, but I think that it's very much about project concept conceptualization and early phase where we can uh, do a good design and not later on. Wonderful, thank you. And Thomas. health is part of it. And health is part of it. Thomas. Yeah, three issues. Um, young people, um, they have idealism, they have belief, they have a hunger for change. We need them. Um, we need impact assessment for transparency, um, equity, and also a more um, environmentally sustainable uh, development in this context. Thank you, Zhu uh, I'm very happy to see that uh, we, uh, international communities, are uh, in, in organizing such a wonderful webinar on BRI. This is very rare, uh, as far as I know. Uh, so my, op my opinion, as I just said, is uh, BRI initiative also, BRI initiative is uh, uh, proposed by Chinese government, but it is not. Uh, uh, it is a not a China's initiative. It is an international initiative. Uh, 
uh, beneficiary to all countries. Uh, so uh, I'm not sure uh, uh, we we should not uh, politicalize this initiative. As I just mentioned that uh, this is the investment decision making, not uh, political decision making. So we must uh, follow the investment and uh, profit and uh, and uh, and the business uh, uh, profit for all countries, not country, not uh, country, uh, not uh, not uh, uh, pro uh, projects. If they are losing money, it is uh, not a successful uh, project. Okay. So okay, so, so this this <laughs> so this is not a political issue. This is uh, actually this is an economic issue for us. It's a bit okay. Thank you. So the 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 importance of the business case as well will drive things. Um, so with that, I would like to say thank you to uh, the speakers and and the audience. But I will also at this point hand over to Sarah for a uh, a formal wrap up. Thanks so much, Ben, for facilitating a really fascinating Q&A. Thank you to our audience members. We know many of you sent in questions that we weren't able to get to in the interests of time, but we will send those along to our panelists uh, so that they can have a look at the types of issues in which you're interested. A huge thank you to Professor Xu Feng Ju from Tsinghua University, Mr. Jean-Luc Fiol all the way from Venezuela, Dr. Thierry Ong from Harvard University, Professor Thomas Fisher from the University of Liverpool, and Francesca Villiani joining us today from Denmark as part of International SOS. It's been a wonderful panel. I'm Professor Sarah Bice. Really, really pleased to have the opportunity to moderate yet another IAIA webinar. Reminder that we do have our annual conference. You can get a handy mug like this one. It'll be online next year. So we look forward to you joining us there. And if you're still around, please take our quick survey at the end of the webinar. We'd love to know what you think and also your ideas for topics for future webinars. And we appreciate your time and attention today. And we'll see you on the internet.